Hi everyone, welcome to Maths World UK. I'm James Grime and today I'm speaking with David Spiegelhalter, Professor Sir David Spiegelhalter, one of the UK's top statisticians and one of my personal favourite human beings as well. And David is here to talk to us about false positives. That's the idea that when you take a medical test, and medical tests, they're not magic, they're not always 100% accurate, you take a medical test and you get a positive result even though you're not ill. So if you get a positive result, what's the chance that you're actually ill? And this is something that people often get wrong, which David is going to tell you all about. Now, as one of the UK's top statisticians, I know that David is very much in demand at the moment. So I started our conversation by asking him if he had had a busy lockdown. Well, I'd like to say I've just been retired and uh, lazing around walking the dog when I could. Um, but it hasn't been like that because, you know, I work in communication and statistics and there's been a lot of statistics to help in the communication of. So it's been unbelievably busy and a massive demand from the media, from whether it's newspapers or television or radio, for people who just explain stuff. And I kind of think, well, you know, that's what I do. That's what I'm supposed to do. I'm not on one side or another. I'm not pro or anti lockdown. I can keep out of all that stuff. I just want to try to uh, improve the quality of discussion of the numbers in the news. So that's all I'm interested in. Because you've been involved in a lockdown story, haven't you? Some some kind of misunderstanding that happened during the lockdown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, so the, basically um, uh, there was a, a story going around uh, that um, the positive tests that have started increasing in, the, in this country about COVID-19 um, are, are mainly false positives. And this was being promoted on the radio and on websites and on newspaper articles by sort of people who are fairly skeptical about lockdown or whatever. And, um, and I got embroiled in this by pointing out, yes, under certain assumptions, they could be nearly all false positives. And so people then started quoting me and saying, oh, well, he supports our arguments. And no, under certain, but those assumptions are not true. And, and that's what I want to go through today. Well, OK, then, David, uh, show us you're working. Show us you're working. So, OK, I've got some bit of high tech, uh, uh, you know, uh, graphics here that I'm sure will. Um, this is about my limit in terms of drawing things. I can't even afford a whiteboard. Um, but here we go. So this is the idea of diagnostic testing. We've got people being tested here and some of them have got the disease and some of them haven't. And some of the people who have got the disease test positive and some test negative. And some of the rows without the disease test positive and some test negative. And if you've learned probability in school over the last so many years, you recognize this as a probability tree. And the probabilities on these arms, we've got names for them. This is the prevalence of the disease. And um, the pro proportion of the people with the disease that test positive is known as the sensitivity. The sensitivity along there. The proportion of the people without the disease who correctly test negative is known as the specificity. I'm going to write very badly down here. And the number we're really interested in is the proportion of the people without the disease who do get a positive test. So these are the false positives. And that proportion there is often known as the false positive rate or the FPR. OK, so let's look at how this plays out in a particular circumstance and how you could get the idea that actually a rather accurate test could still generate mainly false positives. Right, so here we are and we're going to assume we're doing random testing. We're going to pick a group of people, let's say a thousand people from the population and test them at random. Now back when I was discussing this a couple of weeks ago, I mean this argument online, um, the, the, um, there were about one in a thousand were testing, testing positive uh, you know, had in, a, in the random surveys, had, had, the, had the disease. So we got about one there and 999 there. Now let's assume the test is reasonably sensitive. Let's say 80, it's going to pick up 80% of the people and we can round that up and say, we guess we're going, to, we're going to find that person and zero there. Now, the false positive rate, when Matt Hancock, our esteemed um, you know, Deputy Secretary of State for Health, went on the television, he said the false positive rate was about 0.8%. Um, let's call that 1%. And he was making that claim on the basis of studies that have been done of other PCR tests. Those are the tests that are being done in this circumstance. So let's say that's 1%. And that means out of nearly about 1,000 of these, about 10 are going to be false positives. 
and about then 989 will be correct negatives. Okay, so what does this mean in practice for people who get a positive test? We got 11 in total out of 1,000 will get a positive test, and 10 of these are mistakes. 10 of these are errors. Only one of them has actually got the disease. <laughs> and that's what the story was that was going around the internet and, and newspapers and media that most of these tests are, are false claims as making these assumptions. And the mathematics is completely right. It's just that the assumptions are completely wrong. So that's the issue. And unfortunately, I went through this maths uh, on, you know, in a tweet and everyone then started copying it and saying, oh, well, therefore, most tests are false positive. OK, now, why is this wrong? There are two reasons why it's wrong. And I'll, I'll do them both in turn. The first reason it's wrong is that the tests that are being reported every day in the news are not the results of random testing. They're the results of testing people with symptoms as it's supposed to be, you know, only people with symptoms are supposed to go for tests. So let's take a thousand people with symptoms here. And uh, it's reckoned that uh, currently out of a thousand people with symptoms, about 50 actually have the disease. So that's 5%, not one in a thousand, it's one in 20 actually have the disease. If you've got symptoms, it looks like even higher at the moment. Um, but let's say 50 out of that, and that leaves 950 without the disease that we're testing. Now, our test, remember, had 80% sensitivity. It's going to find 80% of these, so it's going to find 40 of those and miss 10. This, remember, we said was about 1%, so it's going to find 9 or 10 of these. Let's say it's going to find 10 of those, and it won't find nine, 940 are correctly um, diagnosed as, as negative. And these 10 false positives. Now, let's look, look at people who get a positive test. We've got 40 up there and 10 up there. 50 people get a positive test and 40 of them are correct. They do have the disease. So the great majority of the positive tests really do have the disease. Now, this is, um, you know, uh, just demonstrate, we're actually doing Bayes' theorem in this case, you know, mathematically. What we're showing is that a, a, a test that is actually rather accurate 99% specificity, 80% sensitivity. Um, if in a low prevalence situation, still most of the positive cases are, that most of the positive tests are, are false positives. It's hopeless. But in a high prevalence situation, it's just fine. And this is very unintuitive that uh, Matt Hancock got it wrong. Um, he didn't, uh, didn't grasp the fact that you can have a, a rather accurate test that still is really bad performance if it's done in a low prevalence population. But this is the real situation. But of course, this isn't the real situation because there's another assumption that's wrong. This false positive rate is nowhere near 1%. What Matt Hancock Klett said is wrong. It's much better than that. The false positive rate is much lower. How do we know that? And this is the interesting thing. I think this is fascinating. Um, if we go back to real random testing, Office for National Statistics have been doing surveys of you know 60,000 families or so a week um, over uh, since since April and uh, look at just these are it's almost a random sample as random as they can get it and they look at what percent actually test positive back in April it was about 0.3 percent and then it dropped to about 0.05 percent over the summer and now it started going back up again we get into October now, it's up here somewhere. Um, but this, oh, it doesn't, that means that only one in 2,000 were testing positive. Now, these tests were handled in exactly the same way as the normal tests that are done. They're sent off to the laboratories, they get a positive result. So we know logically that the false positive rate cannot be higher than this. If it was 1%, we'd be up here somewhere because 1% of our tests would be coming back false positives. So even if these were all fake, all false, our false positive rate would still be below 0.1%, one in a thousand, you know, less, probably one in less than one in 2,000. Um, and I think this is extraordinary. It shows, you know, I thought when they were doing this test, they, were, they tested 125,000 people and only got 50 positive results. And I thought, God, what a waste of money. They're paying these people to do the test. This is costing a fortune. In fact, it was, you know, a low um, prevalent state, which we were in the middle of the summer. This was providing fantastic information about the performance of the test. So actually, if we go back to testing people with symptoms here, 
And if we say that this false positive rate, far from being 1%, is less than 0.1%, it means that rather than being 10, this is less than 1. And so we're going to need 40 true positives up here. You know, a, a fraction of a test down here. The overwhelming, and this is the real situation that's happening at the moment, and this means that the overwhelming proportion of positive tests at the moment are true positives. Now, oh, I just need to add one thing. It doesn't necessarily mean they're infectious. Um, you know, you can get a positive test from remnants of virus that are left over after someone has, is no longer infectious. But that's another matter. That's the definition of what is a positive test. Um, so, uh, so that's it. My case rests. <laughs> it's very convincing as well. I, so it sounds like if you're looking at people with symptoms, it's like you've got two pieces of evidence when you're making a conclusion. So the test is a piece of evidence about whether they really have it and also that they have symptoms. So yeah, sort of, you've got two things that you're adding into your calculation. Exactly. We, we can't interpret the result of a test unless we know why the test was done. And it's very topical at the moment, but it, this is not the only reason why you would be using this sort of idea, is it? No, 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 no. I mean, this is, this is Diagnostic Tests 101. This is, this is, you know, there's endless discussions about this on the web. There's lovely animations and things like that. And um, often done around, uh, we've done lots of this stuff around breast screening, for example, or other screening tests in the community, explaining that, um, you know, the, the uh, a, what looks like quite an accurate test, in fact, can give rise to huge numbers of false positives. And if, if done in a low prevalence community, just like random testing, random screening. And the other area it comes in is, is uh, facial recognition cameras, you know, in crowds, picking out faces, matching them with lists of suspects and then calling the get people in for questioning. Um, that, those are claimed to be accurate, but because the pre prevalence of criminals in the crowd is so low, most of the people it pulls in are going to be false false positives and the arresting officer or, you know who, who's been told this test is 90 percent accurate might erroneously think oh there's a 90 if it picks someone out there's a 90 percent chance he's one of the suspects no it's nowhere near that and so uh as i said my marker is that if anyone ever talks about the accuracy of a diagnostic test don't listen to what they're saying Thanks, David. And just before we go, David actually gave us a couple of questions to think about at home. So you saw how the calculation was performed. Can you do it yourself? So we imagine we're in the same situation where the prevalence is one in a thousand and the sensitivity of the test is 80%. What does the false positive rate need to be if you want the probability of being ill, given a positive result, to be 50%? And if you can do that, let's say we change the sensitivity of the test. Let's say it's 60% instead. Can you perform the calculation then? And finally, we imagine that second test, it's less good. So we imagine it's cheaper. So let's say we gave the test twice. What's the probability of being ill if you get two positive results? Okay, so some things for us to think about, some things for you to try at home. That's all from me for now. So I'll say, stay curious. And I'll see you next time.